Hi, everybody, and welcome to Bocchino Live. We're so looking forward to doing this presentation with you today. We've got so many wonderful titles to tell you about. Here okay, you were your top picks from March's presentation. The first one was Kate Morton's Homecoming. Next is Lisa Scottolini's Loyalty. I've got to tell you, it hit number four on the New York Times list, so your enthusiasm was there all the way. Next was William Landay's All That I Carry, All of Mine I Carry With Me. By the way, these first three books are um, bets on selections. Next, we got Julia Kelly's The Lost English Girl. Got Pineapple Street by Jenny Johnson, which also is a book uh, Port of Bets on Selection. And Hello Beautiful by Ann Napolitano. So those were your top six. We had to go with six this time because there was so much enthusiasm from you folks. So we're going to start out with fiction today. And we're going to begin with Things I Wish I Told My Mother by Susan Patterson, Susan DeLello with James Patterson. Yes, Susan is married to James Patterson. And she came up with this idea for this book when her mom passed away and her friend's mom had passed away also. The two Susans, moms passed away in their 90s. And she says, one day she walked in the kitchen, she says, there are things I wish I told my mother. And he said, well, I think that's an idea for a book. And so she started writing out this idea of what would have happened. The two Susans did travel together as part of the research on this book. And this book was a giveaway on our site and we gave it away to 50 readers. And we've got feedback from about 40 of them that we're gonna share on the site. So you can see their enthusiasm for the book as well. And a lot of people were saying they like to read this with their book groups and you know, like to chat about this book more. So it's out this week. It's a delight, quick ride. And if you haven't been to Paris, I haven't been to Paris, you'll feel like you were there because the writing is so vivid. What we've got is two uh, people. Lori is young. She's an artist. She's a collector of experiences. She works in advertising. Her mother is Dr. Liz. She's a perfectionist. She travels the world with matched luggage. And Dr. Liz is somebody that's really been looked up to because a woman of her age to be a doctor was a big thing. She's kind of looked down on what Lori does all her life. So the two of them go on vacation together. And this is about their experiences, including her bringing back to her mother to her hometown back in Norway. So lots of fun, quick read, really, really quick read, folks. Next, we've got Yours Truly by Ava Jimenez. Um, that's out this week, and we're sharing it as it's April's number one indie next pick. Dr. Brianna Ortiz's life is seriously flatlining. Her divorce is about to be finalized. Her brother is running out of time to find a kidney donor, and that promotion she wants is probably going to the man doctor. But just when all systems are set to hate, Dr. Jacob Maddox completely flips the game by sending her a letter. It's a really good letter. Suddenly, he and Brianna are exchanging letters, sharing lunch dates in her sob closet and discussing the merits of frequently tiny horses. But when Jacob decides to give Brianna the best gift imaginable, a kidney for her brother, she wonders just how she can resist this quietly sexy new doctor, especially when he calls in a favor that she can't refuse. There's yours truly. Next, we've got Saturday Night at the Lakeside Supper Club by J. Ryan Stradell. And you know him as the author of the Kitchens of the Great Midwest. Um, this is coming on April 18th. Marielle Prager needs a break. Her husband, Ned, is having an identity crisis. Her beloved restaurant is bleeding money. And her mother, Florence, is refusing to leave the church where she's been holed up for over a week. The Lakeside Supper Club has been in her family for decades, but Florence never took to it. But Marielle inherited the restaurant, skipping Florence. It created a rift between mother and daughter that never quite healed. Ned knows his family's chain of homestyle diners could provide a better future than his wife's fading restaurant. In the aftermath of a devastating tragedy, Ned and Marielle lose almost everything they hold dear. With their dreams dashed, can one fractured family find a way to rebuild despite their losses? And will the Lakeside Supper Club be their salvation? There we go. Next, we've got Happy Place by Emily Henry. And this is May's number one indie pick. Harriet and Wynne have set out to be the perfect couple since they met in college, but they broke up five months ago and they still haven't told their best friends, which is how they find themselves sharing a bedroom at the main cottage that's been their friend group yearly getaway for the last decade. Only this year, Harriet and Wynne are lying through their teeth while trying not to notice how desperately they still want each other because the cottage is for sale and this is the last week they've all got together in this place. They can't stand to break their friends' hearts, and so they play their parts. After years of being in love, how hard can it be to fake it for one week in front of those you know best? So here we got a group of people faking it. Next, we've got The Half Moon by Mary Beth Keene on sale on May 2nd. 
Malcolm Gephardt, the handsome and gregarious longtime bartender at the Half Moon, has always dreamed of owning a bar. When his boss finally retires, Malcolm stretches to buy the place. He sees unquantifiable magic and potential in the Half Moon and hopes to transform it into a bigger success, but struggles to stay afloat. His smart and confident wife, Jess, has devoted herself to her law career. After years of trying for a baby, she faces the idea that motherhood might not be in the cards for her. And like Malcolm, she feels her youth beginning to slip away and wonders how to reshape her future. The half moon takes place over the course of one week when Malcolm learns shocking news about Jess. A patron of the bar goes missing and a blizzard hits the town of Gillum, trapping everyone in place. So Mary Beth is the author of Ask Again Yes, which I think many of you read a couple of years ago. Very much looking forward to seeing what she does with this book. Next, we've got No Two Persons by Erica Baumeister, on sale on May 2nd. Alice has always wanted to be a writer. Her talent is innate, but her stories remain safe and detached until a devastating event breaks her heart open and she creates a stunning debut novel. Her words, in turn, find their ways to readers, from a teenager hiding her homelessness to a free diver pushing himself beyond endurance, an artist furious at the world <clears throat> around her, a bookseller in search of love, a widower rent by grief. Each one is drawn into Alice's novel. Each one discovers something different that alters their perspective and presents new pathways forward for their lives. Together, their stories reveal how books can affect us in the most beautiful and unexpected ways and how we are more closely connected to one another than we might think. So there you've got no two persons. Okay, let's do some historical fiction. Got a great lineup here. We've got The Golden Doves by Martha Hall Kelly. Oh, you all know her as the author of The Lilac Girls. This one's on sale on April 18th. American Josie Anderson and Parisian Arlette LaRue are thrilled to be working in the French resistance, stealing so many Nazi secrets that they become known as the Golden Doves, renowned across France, France and hunted by the Gestapo. And they're finally arrested and taken to Ravensbrück concentration camp, along with their loved ones. Reclusive Nazi doctor does unspeakable things to Josie's mother, a celebrated Jewish singer. And our let's son is stolen for her, never to be seen again. Decade later, the, the doves fall headlong, in, headlong into a dangerous dual mission. Josie is working for U.S. Army intelligence and accepts an assignment to hunt down the infamous doctor, while a mysterious man tells Arlette he may have found her son. The Golden Doves embark on a quest across Europe and ultimately to French Guyana, discovering a web of terrible secrets and must put themselves in grave danger to finally secure justice and protect the ones they love. So there we've got another story centered around World War II. Next, we've got Only the Beautiful by Susan Meisner, coming on April 18th. We start in California in 1938. When she loses her parents in an accident, 16-year-old Roseanne is taken in by the owners of the vineyard where she's lived her whole life as a vineyard dresser's daughter. Rosie has a secret, however. She sees colors when she hears sound. Driven by loneliness, she lets down her guard and ends up pregnant. Banished, Roseanne believes she is bound for a home for unwed mothers, but soon she finds out she's not going to be in a home of any kind, but to a place far worse than anything she could have imagined. Austria, 1947. After witnessing firsthand Adolf Hitler's brutal pursuit of hereditary purity, Helen Calvert, Calvert is ready to return to America for good. But when she arrives at her brother's vineyard, she is shocked to learn what happened to the Weindrester's daughter, a girl whom Helen had long ago pre uh, befriended. Determined to find Roseanne, Helen discovers that while the war had been won in Europe, there are still terrifying battles to be fought at home. So there's only the Beusable by Susan Meisner. One thing I forgot, um, for those of you who are watching us live, um, tomorrow there will be a contest for one of our spring um, preview contests where you can win a copy of The Golden Doves. So in, um, before it comes out. Next, we've got Where Coyotes Howl by Sandra Davis, which is on sale on April 18th. It's 1916. The two-street town of Wallace is not exactly what Ellen Webster had in mind when he, she accepted a teaching position in Wyoming. Within a year's time, though, she's fallen in love, both with the High Plains and with a handsome cowboy named Charlie Bacon. Life is not easy, but Ellen and Charlie face it together, the relationship growing stronger with each shared success and each deeply felt tragedy. 
Ellen finds purpose in her work as a rancher's wife and her bonds with other women settled on the prairie. Not all of them have loving husbands. Not all came to Wallace willingly. Not all of them can survive the cruel seasons, but they look for out for each other, share their secrets and help one another in times of need. And the needs are great and constant. I don't know how many of you have watched the a prequel to the two prequels to um, Yellowstone, which is 1883 and 1923. And you see how hard it was to like, you know, live at those times out in the West. Um, Paulette Giles calls us addictive and highly uh, recommended. And I will tell you that when Sandra um, writes a book, I always find myself walking away from it, remembering what the book was about with really vivid characters. So if you haven't given her a try, I highly recommend her. Next, we've got the gifts from Liz Hyder. It's coming on April 25th. In October 1840, a young woman staggers alone through a forest in the English countryside as a huge pair of impossible wings rip themselves from her shoulders. In London, rumors of a fallen angel cause a frenzy across the city, and a surgeon desperate for fame and fortune finds himself in the grips of a dangerous obsession, one that will place the women he seeks in the most terrible danger. Spellbinding tale told through five different perspectives and set against the luminous backdrop of 19th century London. The Gifts explores science, nature, and religion, enlightenment, the role of women in society, and the dark danger of ambition. I've got the gifts, and this was, was a spring preview title. Next, we've got Clytemnestra by Costanza Cassati. Um, this book was originally supposed to come out early. Crazy story. The truck that the finished books was um, traveling on had an accident and the books went on fire. I mean, it's absolutely crazy. Think of the book Clytemnestra. This is exactly what happened. So they moved the on sale date to May 2nd. So in it, you were born to be a king. Um, born to a king, you marry a tyrant. You stand by helplessly as he sacrifices your child to placate the gods. You watch him wage war on a foreign shore and you comfort yourself with violent thoughts of your own because this was not the first offense event against you. This was not the life you ever deserved. This will not be your undoing. Slowly you plot. Your husband returns in triumph. You become a woman with a choice, acceptance or vengeance. Infamy follows both. So you bide your time and force the God's hands in the game of retribution. For you understand something long ago that the others never did. Power isn't given to you. You have to take it for yourself. This book was also one of the indie um, selections um, for, I believe it was April, but now it's coming out May 2nd. Now we've got The Covenant of Water by Abraham Verghese. Um, many of you are going to remember him as the author of Cutting for Stone. It's coming on May 2nd. Spanning the years from 1900 to 1997, The Covenant of Water is set in Kerala on South India's Malabar coast. and follows three generations of a family that suffer a peculiar affliction. In every generation, at least one person dies by drowning. In Kerala, the water is everywhere. The turn of the century, a 12-year-old girl from Kerala's long-existing Christian community, grieving the death of her father, is sent by boat to her wedding, where she will meet, all for this folks, her 40-year-old husband for the first time. Yes, she's 12, he's 40. From this unforgettable new beginning, the young girl and future matriarch, known as Big Amachi, Amamachi will witness unthinkable changes over the span of her extraordinary life, full of joy and triumph, as well as hardship and loss, her faith and love, the only constants. So we've got Covenant of Water, and I absolutely love the colors in that cover. Next, we've got The Secret Book of Flora Lee, which is coming from Patty Callahan Henry on May 2nd. The war-torn London of 1939, 14-year-old Hazel and five-year-old Flora are evacuated to a war, rural village to escape the horrors of the Second World War. Hazel distracts her sister with a fairy tale about a magical land, a secret place that they can escape to that's all their own. When Flora suddenly vanishes while playing near the banks of a river, Hazel blames herself. She carries that guilt into adulthood. 20 years later, Hazel lives in an elegantly time-worn Bloomsbury flat with her charming boyfriend. But her tidy life is upended upside down one day when she unwraps a package containing an illustrated book called Whisperwood and the River of Stars. Could this book hold the secrets to Flora's disappearance? Could it be a sign that her beloved sister is still alive after all these years? There we've got the secret book of Flora Lee. Here we've got some thrillers and mysteries and we've got some great ones. 
This one I just finished the other night. It's by Megan Miranda. It's a book reporter bets on selection. It was a spring preview title. It's really, really so well done. A decade ago, two vans filled with high school seniors on a school service trip crashed into a Tennessee ravine, a tragedy that claimed the lives of multiple classmates and teachers. The nine students who managed to escape the river that night were irrevocably changed. A year later, one of the survivors dies by suicide on the anniversary of the crash. The rest of them make a pact to come together every year to commemorate that terrible night, to keep one another safe, to keep one another accountable, or both. Their annual meeting is at a house on the Outer Banks. It's long been their refuge, and almost immediately, something feels off this year. But they promised long ago each survivor will do whatever he or she can do to save one another, won't they? So this takes place over the course of seven days, and it's seven people, and it is so well done, and it's twisty and turning, and I know Megan really well, and I'm sitting there like, you write these like really like twisty, turny stories, and she just sits there and smiles, and a lot of times she doesn't even know where the ending's going to be, but she just gets herself there. The book's getting a lot of acclaim, so uh, keep your eye out for it. Next, we've got Don Winslow's City of Dreams. It's coming out on April 18th. On the losing side of a bloody East Coast crime war, Danny Ryan is now on the run. The mafia, the cops, and the FBI all want him dead or in prison. With his little boy, his elderly father, and the tattered remnants of his loyal crew of soldiers, he makes the classic American migration to California to start a new life. The feds track him down, and they want Danny to do them a favor. They could make him a fortune or kill him. And when Hollywood starts shooting a film based on his former life, Danny demands a piece of the action and begins to rebuild his criminal empire. Then he falls in love. The beautiful movie star who has a dark past of her own. As their worlds collide in an explosion that could destroy them both, Danny Ryan has the right to fight, has to fight for his life in a city where dreams are born or where they go to die. Now, there's interesting news this week came out, or last week, end of last week, that um, this show has been cast to be um, either a movie or a series. And uh, the young man who played Austin Butler, who played Elvis, is going to be a starring as Danny Ryan. So that's like huge news. I believe this is the third book in the series. I will have Tom confirm that. But I think this is the third in the series. Tom, correct me if I'm wrong. But I think it is. Um, and Don had originally started these uh, books a couple of years ago. Next, we've got Symphony of Secrets from Brendan Slocum. Now, you're going to know him as the author of The Violent Conspiracy. Um, as one of the world's preeminent experts on the famed 20th century composer, Frederick Delaney, Bern Hendricks knows everything there is to know about the man behind the music. When Mallory Roberts, a direct descendant of Delaney, asks for Bern's help authenticating a newly discovered piece, which may be his lost famous opera, Red, he jumps at the chance. 1920s Manhattan, Josephine Reed meets struggling musician Frank Delaney. But where young Delaney struggles, jo Josephine soars, she's a natural pro protege, who hears a beautiful music in the sounds of the world around her. With Josephine as a silent partner, Delaney's career can take off. And in the present day, Byrne and Ebony begin to uncover more clues that indicate Delaney might have had help in composing his most successful work. They become caught in the crosshairs of a powerful organization that will stop at nothing to keep their secret hidden. So there we've got Symphony of Secrets. And as I'm looking at this, I'm thinking of that movie Tar and how things happen behind the scenes in the symphony world that I just never knew. Okay, we've got Where Are the Children Now? And this is the sequel to the classic suspense novel that Mary Higgins Clark wrote years ago called Where Are the Children? And she had written books the last couple of years of her life with Alifair Burke. So Alifair is picking up the story now. Where are the children? A young California mother named Nancy Harmon was convicted of murdering her two children. Though released on a technicality, she was abandoned by her husband and changed her identity to start a new life. Years later, her two children from a second marriage, Mike and Melissa, would go missing. And Nancy, yet again, became the prime suspect. She was able to confront the secrets buried in her past and rescue her kids. Now more than four decades since readers first met Nancy and her children comes this thrilling sequel. 
a lawyer turned successful podcaster, Melissa has recently married a man whose first wife died tragically, leaving him and their young daughter, Riley, behind. Then Melissa's new stepdaughter goes missing. Drawing on the experience of their own abduction, Melissa and Mike race to find Riley and save her from the trauma they still struggle with or worse. So there you've got a sequel, Where Are the Children Now? Next, we've got Small Mercies from Dennis Lehane, another author we haven't heard from in a while. In the summer of 1974, a heat wave blankets Boston, and Mary Pat Fennessy is trying to stay one step ahead of the bill collectors. Mary Pat has lived her entire life in the housing projects of Southie, the Irish-American enclave that stubbornly adheres to old tradition. One night, Mary Pat's teenage daughter, Jewel, stays out late and doesn't come home. That evening, a young Black man is found dead under mysterious circumstances. The two events seem unconnected, but Mary Pat, propelled by a desperate search for her missing daughter, begins overturning stones, best left untouched, asking questions that bother Marty Butler, chieftain of the Irish mob, and the men who work for him, men who don't take kindly to any threats to their business. So there's small mercies. Next, we've got With My Little Eye by Jocelyn Jackson. And it's interesting to know that Jocelyn always records her own audiobooks. I had a long talk with her um, when, last time I, I, I saw her. So keep in mind that the audio is most likely being read by her. And this is coming out on April 25th. For actress Maribel Mills, disturbing fan mail is part of the price of fame. So when she starts getting creepy letters written in fruit-scented markers, she's mostly unfazed. There's something different about Marker Man. Maribel's sheets smell of unfamiliar cologne, and objects have gone missing around the house. Plus, the letters have become more perverse, with drawings of a naked Maribel tied up or chopped in pieces. She and her daughter move from Los, uh, from Los Angeles to Atlanta for a fresh start, but no distance is great enough. Years of being in front of a camera have given Maribel a superpower. She can feel their eyes on her, a creeping sensation like bees inside her skin. And someone definitely has her in their sights. Could Marker Man have followed her across the country? So we got the ferryman from Justin Cronin. The, it's coming on May 2nd. The archipelago of Prospero lies hidden from the horrors of a deteriorating outside world. Its lucky citizens enjoy long, fulfilling lives until the monitors embedded in their forearms fall below 10%. Then they retire themselves, embarking on a ferry ride to an island known as the nursery, where their failing bodies are renewed, their memories are wiped clean, and they're ready to start a fresh night, life, start, restart life afresh. Proctor Bennett has a satisfying career as a ferryman, gently shepherding people through the retirement process. But there comes a day when he is summoned to retire his own father who gives him a disturbing and cryptic message before being wrestled onto the ferry. Soon Proctor finds himself questioning everything he once believed and on a desperate mission to uncover the truth. Just remember your forearm goes below 10%. Boop, there's a signal, go to the ferry. Okay, we have got a lot of memoirs, biographies, and nonfiction this month. Starting out with Koresh by Stephen uh, Talty. Uh, it's on sale this week. Um, I will also share that there's a really good a show about Waco that is on uh, Netflix that I watched a couple of weeks ago. And it's interesting because um, somebody who's on that show is Christopher Wickham. And he was with the FBI. And they actually became friends with Chris years ago when he wrote a book called Cold Zero. And in Cold Zero, he partly writes about what happened in Waco when the Branch Davidians, you know, the, the, the building blew up and you know what happened there. And he's actually on this show. And you can see the toll that this has taken on him. I haven't seen him in years. And you see that even talking about this today is really, really rough. No other event in the last 50 years is as shrouded in myth like the 1993 siege of the Branch Davidians in Waco, Texas. Today, we remember this moment for the 76 people, including 20 children, who died in the fire for its inspiration of the Oklahoma City bombing, for the wave of anti-government military, militarism that followed. What we understand is far less of what motivated the Davidians' enigmatic leader, David Koresh. Drawing on first-time exclusive interviews with his family and survivors of the siege, best-selling author Stephen Talty paints a psychological portrait of this infamous icon of the 1990s. 
He reveals Hakoresh's fixation on holy war, which would deliver the Davidians to their reward and confirm him as Christ, collided with his paranoid obsession with firearms to a destructive effect. But this book is as well done as the, the series. I mean, it was just, you really get the story of like what's inside. And sometimes you need time to move away. If you wrote this 10 years ago, wouldn't have the same effect. Now we're looking at it 20 years ago. It's like, oh, wait a second. What really did happen there? Actually, 30 years ago. I can't do math today. You could make this place beautiful by Maggie Smith. I am really looking forward to reading this. In her memoir, poet Maggie Smith explores the disintegration of her marriage and her renewed commitment to herself in lyrical vignettes that shine hard and clear as jewels. The book begins with one woman's personal particular heartbreak, but its circles widen into a reckoning with contemporary womanhood, traditional gender roles, and the power dynamics that persist even in many progressive homes. The spirit of self-inquiry and empathy she's known for, she weaves snapshots of a life with meditations on secrets, anger, forgiveness, and narrative herself. And the power, the power of these pieces is cumulative. Page after page, they build in a larger integration of family, work, and patriarchy. So there you've got, you could make this place beautiful. I love the way they did that cover too. Next, we've got The Wager, um, which is by David Gran. This is coming on April 18th. And on January 28th, 1742, a ramshackle vessel of patched together wooden cloth washed up on the coast of Brazil. Inside, there were 30 emaciated men, barely alive, and they had an extraordinary tale to tell. They were survivors of His Majesty's ship, the Wager, a British vessel that had left England in 1740 on a secret mission, mission during an imperial war with Spain. Six months later, Another, even more decrepit craft, lands on the coast of Chile. This boat contained three castaways, and they told a very different story. The 30 sailors who landed in Brazil were not heroes. They were mutineers. The first group responded with countercharges of their own. As accusations of treachery and murder flew, the Admiralty convened a court-martial to determine who was telling the truth. You know David as the author of Killers of the Flower Moon, which is also being made into a movie, and I think it's scheduled for fall to be coming out. Next, we got Honey Baby Mine by Laura Dern and Diane Ladd. Laura Dern and Diane Ladd always had a close relationship. The stakes were raised when Diane developed a sudden life-threatening illness. Diane's doctor prescribed long walks to build back her lung capacity. The exertion was challenging. Alora still soon learned the best way to distract her mom was to get her talking and telling stories. Their conversations along the way began to break down the traditional barriers between mothers and daughters. They discussed the most personal topics, love, sex, marriage, divorce, art, ambition, and legacy. In Honey Baby Mine, Laura and Diane share these conversations, as well as reflections and anecdotes, taking readers on an intimate tour of their lives. So there you got Honey Baby Mine. A mother and daughter talk life, death, life, and love, and banana pudding. Love that. Knowing What We Know by Simon Winchester is on sale on April 25th. With the advent of the internet, any topic we want to know is instantly available with the touch of a smartphone button. With so much knowledge at our fingertips, what is there left for our brains to do? At a time when we seem to be stripping all value from the idea of knowing things, no need for math, no need for map reading, no need for memorization, are we risking our ability to think? So we empty our minds, we one day incapable of thoughtfulness. Addressing these questions, Simon Winchester just explores how humans have attained, stored, and disseminated knowledge. Examining such disciplines as education, journalism, encyclopedia creation, museum curation, photography, and broadcasting, he looks at a whole range of knowledge diffusion. And it's really interesting at my parents' house, they had this group of encyclopedias up on the wall. My father said, I wonder who wants them. And I said, no one. I said, those are from 1970. They're still calling it the USSR. It's not Russia. I said, but the one thing I have heard that they take those for is kids when they're doing projects need pictures and they like to cut them up to have the pictures to put in the projects that they're doing. But it just shows this, these lines of just making you think how you know, life has changed and how much you do just grab the smartphone to do everything. And the smartphone, you realize is ridiculously expensive, but you realize what you're carrying around is this crazy knowledge base of the map, where you're going for dinner. You can make a reservation. You can do all these things. 
flipping buttons. But like, can we do math the same way if we're just doing it on the phone? Very, very interesting topic. Hammer Girl by Carl Seferaza Anthony. Hammer Girl brings to cinematic life the um, Jackie Bois Kennedy's years as a young single woman trying to figure out who she wanted to be. Chafing at the expectations of her family and the societal limitations placed on women, she, perturbed, she pursued her dream career as a writer. Set primarily during the years of 1949 to 1953, she was in her early 20s, the book recounts in heretofore unrevealed detail the story of her late college years and her early adulthood as a working woman. And you think about today, she had not gone on to marry Jack Kennedy. And she was somebody who was this interested, went on to work at um, Doubleday years later. What would her life have been like if she didn't do that? She already had a lot of, uh, you know, uh, 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 esteem. She knew a lot of people. She came from a storied background. What would have happened for her? So just something to think about. We've got The First Lady of World War II by Shannon McKenna Schmidt. Um, Shannon was a staffer years ago at Book Report Network. I'm really happy to see this is, I believe, the third book she's done. She did a great book at the beginning called Novel Destinations, which is all places to travel for literary travel. It was really, really terrific. And here we've got the First Lady of World War II. It's on sale on May 2nd. On August 27th, 1943, news broke in the United States. The First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt was on the other side of the world. Closely guarded secret. She'd left San Francisco aboard a military transport plane headed for the South Pacific to support the troops on the front lines of World War II. Americans believe that she was secluded at home. As Allied forces battled the Japanese for control of the region, Eleanor was there on the front lines, spending five weeks traveling on a mission as First Lady of the United States to experience what our servicemen were experiencing and report back home. And this is her daring journey to the front lines and back. And it was something I did not know anything about. Shannon's a master uh, researcher. There, I'm sure this is going to be just a fascinating story. Now I've got some June titles to look forward to because I'd like you to get you keep ahead. First, we've got Crow Mary by Kathleen Grissom, which is coming on June 6th. In 1872, a 16-year-old goes first. A Crow native woman marries Abe Farwell, a white fur trader. Gives her the name Mary, and they set off on the long trip to his trading post in the Cypress Hills of Saskatchewan, Canada. Along the way, she finds a fast friend, makes a lifelong enemy, and despite learning a dark secret of Farwell's past, falls in love with her husband. Then, on the eve of their return to Montana, a dr group of drunken whiskey traders slaughters 40 Nakoda, despite Farwell's efforts to stop them. Mary, hiding from the hail of bullets, sees murderers take five Dakota, Nakota women back to their fort. She begs Farwell to save them, and when he refuses, she takes two guns, creeps into the fort, and saves the woman from certain death. And then she sets off a whirlwind of colliding cultures that pushes the love between Farwell and Crown Mary to the breaking point. So there you've got that. She wrote The Kitchen House. I'm sure many of you remember that book. I've got The House of Lincoln by Nancy Horan. Well, she's the author of Loving Frank. We ran a contest for this book recently. Really excited for this coming on June 6th, and I will be interviewing her. Showing intelligence behind society's expectations, 14-year-old Anna Ferraria lands a job in the Lincoln household, assisting Mary Lincoln with their boys and with hostess duties, born by the wife of a rising political star. Anna bears witness to the evolution of Lincoln's views on equality and the union, and observes in full complexity the psyche and pain of his bold, polarizing wife, Mary. Along with her African-American friend, Cal, Anna encounters the presence of an underground railroad in town and experiences personally how slavery is tearing apart her adopted country, culminating in an eyewitness account of the little known Springfield race riot of 1908, the House of Lincoln takes readers on a journey through historic changes that reshaped America and continue to reverberate today. I'm very anxious to see what Nancy did with this book. Next, we've got a book that is very eagerly anticipated. It's Lady Tan's Circle of Women by Lisa C. 
always know Lisa C is not a book a year author. And, but when she writes, it's a event, it's a big moment because she's always writing about something that you probably didn't think about before. Like how many of you, you know, would sit there and say, let me go Google how bound feet look after reading, you know, one of her books or go look and say, how can we experience tea tasting, which she actually has you do with a number of her books. And she will have with this one as well. So this is coming on June 6th. According to Confucius, an educated woman is a worthless woman, but Tan is being raised by her grandparents to be of use. Her grandmother is one of only a handful of female doctors in China, and she teaches Tan the pillars of Chinese medicine. From a young age, she learns about women's illnesses alongside a young midnight wife in training, whose name is Mei Ling. Two girls find fast friendship and a mutual purpose. No mud, no lotus. They tell themselves, from adversity, beauty can bloom. But when Tan is sent into an arranged marriage, her mother-in-law forbids her from seeing Mei Ling and from helping the women in the household. She's to act like a proper wife, embroider foot, a bound foot slippers, pluck instruments, recite poetry, give birth to sons, and stay forever within the walls of the family compound, the garden of fragrant delights. So let's see what happens to Lady Tan and her circle of women. Very eagerly anticipated book. Next, we've got The Wind Knows My Name by Isabel Allende, also coming on June 6th. Vienna in 1938, Samuel Adler is five years old when his father disappears from Kristallnacht, the night his family loses everything. As her child's safety becomes ever harder to guarantee, Samuel's mother secures a spot for him on a kinder transport train out of Nazi-occupied Austria to England. He boards alone, carrying nothing but a change of clothes and his violin. In Arizona in 2019, eight decades later, Anita Diaz and her mother flee looming danger in El Salvador and seek refuge in the United States. But their arrival coincides with the new family separation policy. The seven-year-old Anita finds herself alone in a camp at Nogales. She escapes her tenuous reality through her true trips to Azans as Bahar, a magical world of imagination. Meanwhile, Selena Duran, a young social worker, enlists the help of a successful lawyer in tracking down Anita's mother. We'll see how these stories come together. The wind knows my name. You also know her as the author of the, A Long Petal of the Sea. Next, we've got from Viola Shipman, Famous in a Small Town. It's coming on June 13th. Many of you I know appreciate Viola's uh, writing. It's Wade Rouse who writes in honor of his grandmother using her name, Viola Shipman. For most of her 80 years, Mary Jackson has endured a steady stream of tourists, influencers, and real estate developers who've discovered the lakeside charm of Good Heart, Michigan. Waiting patiently for the arrival of a stranger, she's believed that since childhood would one day carry on her legacy, the very cherry general store. Mary had almost given up hope that the mysterious prediction she'd be told that a girl would come through and the store would have to pass to a man. So Becky Thatcher comes to Goodhart to forget that she's just turned 40 with nothing to show for it. Ending up at the general store with Mary is not the beach vacation she expected, but more the more feisty octogenarian talks about destiny, the stronger Becky's memories of her own childhood holidays become, and the strange visions over the lake that she was never sure were real. She works under Mary's wing for the summer. She starts to believe that destiny could be real and might have something very special in mind for Becky. So there's Famous in a Small Town. Next, we've got the Five Star Weekend from Ellen Hildebrand. I believe she said that she's going to stop writing fiction in 2024. I'm almost sure that's what she said. Um, so this is one of the last books we'll be seeing, one of her beach titles coming on June 13th. Hollis Shaw's life seemed picture perfect. She's creator of the popular food blog, Hungry with Hollis, and is married to Matthew, a dreamy heart surgeon. But after she and Matthew get into a heated argument one snowy morning, he leaves for the airport and is killed in a car accident. The cracks in Hollis's perfect life, her strained marriage, and her complicated relationship with her daughter, Caroline, grow deeper. When Hollis hears about something called a five-star weekend, one woman organizes a trip for her best friend from each phase of her life, her teenage years, her 20s, her 30s, and midlife. She decides to host her own five-star weekend, but the weekend doesn't turn out to be a joyful Hallmark movie. So there you go. I don't know. Think about that. Who would you bring with you from your 20s, your 30s, and midlife? Think about the friends you bring along the way. 
Okay, next we've got from Fiona Davis, who was one of our Booker Chino Live book groups um, uh, authors a couple of months ago, or early, no, early in April. April. Um, we've got The Spectacular. It's coming on June 13th. New York City in 1956, 19-year-old Marion Brooks knows she should be happy. Her high school sweetheart's about to propose, but instead she feels trapped. So when she comes across an opportunity to audition for the Radio City Rockettes, she jumps, I want to say she kicks at the chance, to exchange her predictable future for the dazzling life of a performer. Meanwhile, the city is reeling from a string of bombings orchestrated by a person the press has nicknamed Big Apple Bomber. And with the public in an uproar, the police turn to Peter Griggs, a young doctor in a local mental hospital who espouses a radical new technique, psychological profiling. Both Marion and Peter find themselves unexpectedly pulled into the police search for the bomber. Marion realizes as much as she's been training herself to blend in, if she hopes to catch the, bo the bomber, she needs to stand out and take a terrifying risk. In doing so, she may be forced to sacrifice everything she's worked for, as well as the people she loves most. So I love when Fiona was showing us both. These are the books of well, um, the, on a shelf of this is where she's done her research. And you know, that's gonna be some kind of an explosive story coming from her. Next, we've got What Remains coming from Wendy Walker. Detective Elise Sutton is drawn to cold cases. Each case is a crime, a puzzle to solve, pulled from the past. She looks for cracks in the circus, surface and becomes an expert on how murderers slip up and give themselves away. She dedicated her life to creating a sense of order at work, at home, and within herself battling her own demons. She has everything under control until one afternoon when she walks into a department store and is forced to make a terrible choice to save one life, she will have to take another. She's held as a hero, but she doesn't feel like one and she's steeped in guilt. And a leave of absence from work, she's numb, even to her husband and daughters, until she connects with Wade Austin, the tall man whose life she saved. But Lee soon realizes that he isn't who we say he is. In fact, Wade Austin isn't even his real name. Tall man is a ghost one who will set off a terrifying game of cat and mouse, threatening Elise and the people she loves most. So it's what remains. Imagine you save the wrong person. Next, we've got Zero Days coming from Ruth Ware. And we know that from the It Girl and the Women in Cabin 10, we know we've got big readers of the Ruth Ware titles. Hired by companies to break into buildings and hack security systems, Jack and her husband Gabe are the best penetration specialists in the building. But after routine assignment goes horribly wrong, Jack arrives home to find her husband dead. To add to her horror, the police are closing in on the suspect, Jack. Suddenly on the run and quickly running out of options, she must decide who she can trust as she circles closer to the real killer. So unlike the woman in Cabin 10, which is a locked mystery, this one is going to be more outside. Then we've got The First Ladies by Marie Benedict and Victoria Christopher Murray. You know these two as the best-selling authors of The Personal Librarian. And we know how much you enjoyed that book and you enjoyed the book club talk that we did with them. My gosh, thousands of people have watched the interview we did with them. The daughter of formerly enslaved parents, Mary McLeod Bethune, refuses to back down as white supremacists thwart her, thwart her work. She marches on as an activist and an educator and her reputation grows she becomes a celebrity revered by titans of business and recognized by U.S. presidents. Eleanor Roosevelt is awestruck and eager to make Mary's acquaintance. Initially drawn together because of their shared belief in women's rights and the power of education, Mary and Eleanor become fast friends, holding each other's hands through tragedy and triumph. When FDR is elected president, the two women begin to collaborate more closely. Eleanor becomes a controversial first lady. Remember that trip to the front lines? for outspokenness, particularly on civil rights. And when she receives threats because of her strong ties to Mary's, it only fuels the women's desire to fight together for justice and equality. Should be a big release coming on June 27th. So these are some notable April paperback releases. Um, we've got Viola Davis's Finding Me, Emily Giffen's Meant to Be, which I thought was just a fun book. It was one of my bets on selections. Jennifer Weiner, The Summer Place, which is set up on the Cape. Linwood Barclay's Take Your Breath Away, which was a bets on selection. Adriana Trajani's The Good Left Undone. Lifeguards by Banda Ear Award, which I also picked as a bets on. And The Puzzler by A.J. Jacobs, who's one of my favorite people, simply because he does such crazy things in order to uh, write his books. And he lived biblically for a year. Uh, I can't remember what he's doing right now, but 
all I can say is AJ's wife is up for sainthood and he agrees with me on that. These are my early bets on selections of the year. So far, I've picked five and four is nine. I think I've got two more that I'll be adding in a couple of weeks. Being super selective this year. Um, so when you know you're looking at these, they're books that I really, really, really loved. Also for Lisa Scottolini, don't forget, as you read the book or after you read the book, she's got an interactive map on her site and you can click on and see the locations and hear her actually talking about each of the places that are in the book. She hadn't written the book um, before she went to Sicily. So as a result, that definitely inspired what was going on. So just something to think about. Um, we've done a number of uh, talks to interviews this year. The most recent one is with things I wish I told my mother with the two Susans. It was really fun to say Susan, answer the question figure out which one. Um, we did The House is on Fire with Rachel Beanland, Lisa with Loyalty, The House of Eve um, with, okay, I'm spacing, of Sadiqa Johnson and William Landon with All This Mine I Carry With Me. Um, I really enjoy doing these interviews. I'm trying to line up Kate Morton right now. Um, I'm going to be out, let's see, the slide says this next weekend. Yes, it's good timing, Tom. That was good putting that slide there. Um, I'm going to be at the Mystery, Hamptons Mystery and Crime Festival. It's called Hamptons Who Done It. This weekend, um, I'm going to be interviewing uh, three authors who moved to the other side of the desk from being editors, um, AJ Finn, Nita Prose, and Greer Hendricks, and talking to them about their careers being on the other side of the desk. I'm also going to be talking to four authors about uh, Neo, wait a second, it's um, Nevo, mm, I'm spacing, why, why am I not thinking of this? Um, Neo like dark writing. Dark, dark, the uh, dark writing and where it's going today and what's happening. I'm having so much fun. This is a category I don't know anything about. I'm getting a complete education. I actually got a library card and got their books out because I knew I needed to, you know, research this in a quick amount of time. So Greg just picked up two more for me, and I'm like buzzing through these books for the, this part of the conversation. And the last panel is going to be with um, Anthony Horowitz and Michael Connolly, and it's going to be talking about books to film. And these days you can't just write a book. You got to make a movie about it for people to really care. So that will be April th um, 13th to 16th. If you're out there and you see me or just come over and say hi, because I'm not going to know you. You guys would know me. I'm, I'm hoping that you could spend time doing this. They're hoping to make this an annual event. And they've really got a fabulous lineup over the days. And you know, sometimes you go to a festival and you got to pick what you want to see. There's only one track the whole time. So let's make it really easy for just to see a number of authors. Um, our next Book of Chino Live event is going to be on April 26th, and it is with Kristen Hanna. We're going to be discussing the four wins. Hannah's, Kristen's been a good friend of mine for years and years and years. And I am so delighted that she will be joining us for this evening and be talking about the four wins. And she's got so much to share about this book. I know it's been out a couple of years, just came out in paperback. And when we do these events, we try to wait for a book to have enough people have read it and want to sit and talk about it. So this event will be on April 26th. Our next Bookachino Live event will be um, for books releasing on from May 9th to June 6th. Cannot believe we're almost halfway through the year. And we'll be peeking ahead at July. And it's going to be on Wednesday, May 10th at 2 o'clock. And sign up will be available later on bookreporter.com. So thank you so much for joining us. Those who are live, if you'd like to stick around for questions. But to everyone else who's watching virtually, thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you next month.